Well, good afternoon and welcome to this introduction to the 10 Million Names Project sponsored by American Ancestors. We are pleased to offer this program with a number of our colleagues on the 10 Million Names Project to let you know about this latest endeavor to identify, recover the names of the estimated 10 million men, women, and children of African descent who were enslaved in pre- and post-colonial America, specifically the territory that would become the United States. This project is dedicated to identifying those individuals, and we seek to amplify the voices of people who have been telling their stories for centuries, connecting researchers and data partners with people seeking answers to family history questions and to expand access to data and resources and information about African Americans. And we are joined today by colleagues on the 10 Million Names Project. Uh, I'm pleased to uh, first introduce our chief historian, Dr. Kendra Field, who is Associate Professor of History and Director of the Center for the Study of Race and Democracy at Tufts University. Professor Field is the author of Growing Up with the Country, Family, Race, and Nation After the Civil War. Uh, her current book project, The Stories We Tell, is a history of African-American genealogy and storytelling from the Middle Passage to the present. As a public historian, Dr. Field uh, co-founded the African American Trail Project and the Du Bois Forum, a retreat for writers, scholars, and artists of color. And she serves as the project historian for the Du Bois Freedom Center. It is my pleasure uh, now to turn things over to Professor Field. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks, Ryan. I'm I'm going to briefly introduce uh, my my uh, colleague, uh, Dr. Carrie Greenwich, who is um, uh, our representative from the Scholars Council today. Dr. Carrie Greenwich is Mellon Associate Professor in the Department of Studies and Race, Colonialism and Diaspora, uh, and History at Tufts University. She teaches courses on Black and Native New England, Black Boston, and the history of slavery, Reconstruction, and their aftermaths in the U.S. Dr. Greenwich is the author of award-winning books, including Black Radical, The Life and Times of William Monroe Trotter, and the recently released critically acclaimed National Book Award nominee, The Grim Keys, The Legacy of Slavery in an American Family. Um, it was recently listed as the best book of a uh, best book of the year by the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and the Boston Globe. Dr. Greenwich is a recognized scholar of Black New England, whose works have appeared in the New York Times, The Atlantic, and The New Yorker, among others, and she co-directs. Um, the African American Shell Project and is a co-founder of the Du Bois Forum. Thank you so much, Kendra. I'm going to introduce my lovely colleague, Lindsay Fulton. Lindsay Fulton is a nationally recognized professional genealogist and lecturer who joined American Ancestors and the National New England Historical and Genealogical Society in 2012. She leads the research and library services team as vice president and as well as the research team working on 10 million names. She's a frequent contributor to the NEHGS blog, Vita Brevis, and she was featured in the Emmy-winning program, Finding Your Roots, The Seedlings. Before NEHGS, Lindsay worked at the National Archives and Records Administration in Waltham, where she designed and implemented an original curriculum program exploring the Chinese exclusion era for elementary school students. She holds a BA from Merrimack College and an MA from the University of Massachusetts, Boston. Thank you. And as we get ready to begin our program today, uh, we'll tell you a, a bit about the organization behind the 10 Million Names Project. American Ancestors is a national center for family history, heritage, and culture. Uh, we are indeed the first genealogical organization uh, founded in America established in 1845. For more than 175 years, we have supported nonprofit genealogy and scholarly publishing and helping people identify uh, with their ancestors. 
We are supported by a staff of more than 95 professionals in genealogy, library science, information science, and other nonprofit professionals. Through our web presence, AmericanAncestors.org, we offer access to more than 1.4 billion digital records and have a manuscript collection of more than 28 million original items. You may be familiar with our location as one of the uh, filming sites for the popular PBS show, Finding Your Roots with Henry Louis Gates Jr. And we're also proud to participate in the research uh, for Finding Your Roots with Dr. Gates. We have founded the 10 Million Names Project um, as an effort to seek to recover the names and restore information to families of the estimated 10 million men, women, and children of African descent who were enslaved in America before 1865. And we're doing this through a collaborative network of expert genealogists, cultural organizations, and community-based family historians. It is important to note who is involved in this project. This is a genealogical and historical project, which includes professional genealogists, historians, descendant communities, family historians, cultural institutions, and institutions of higher education. Our work is supported by an advisory board of luminaries in public history, uh, as well as in uh, other aspects of public life. We are supported by Dr. Henry Louis Gates, by Will York, Paula Madison, our founding executive director, Richard Cellini, who was also the founder of the Georgetown Memory Project, Maddie McFadden Lawson, and our honorary advisory board member is Supreme Court Justice Katanji Brown Jackson. In addition to our advisory board, we are also advised by a leading group of scholars, including our chief historian, Dr. Kendra Field of Tufts University, Dr. Vincent Brown of Harvard University, Dr. Henry Louis Gates Jr., also of Harvard, Dr. Tavolia Glimp of Duke University, Dr. Kerry Greenwich, who joins us today as well, of Tufts University, and Dr. Brandon Terry of Harvard University. It is an important aspect of this project that our work is supported by a number of genealogists, uh, historians, and communications professionals. And uh, the core team at American Ancestors uh, for the 10 Million Names Project includes Dr. Kendra Field, Richard Cellini, uh, Zabeda Chafee Velaz, Lindsay Fulton, uh, Jonathan Hill, Danielle Rose, Joyce Jones, Hale Merch, uh, and Claire Vale. In addition to our team of researchers and communication professionals, we are supported by a number of founding collaborators in the space of public history, genealogy, and history. Uh, you see a, a number of these collaborators noted here today, um, important among them, the Afro-American Historical and Genealogical Society, uh, as well as a, a number of other key collaborators uh, for whom we are sharing data, uh, as well as producing uh, new information to help support the efforts of the 10 Million Names Project. To speak more about the uh, aims and methodology of the 10 Million Names Project, I'm pleased to turn the program over now to our chief historian, Dr. Kendra Field. Okay, I think one slide um, before that, Kathleen. Um, so uh, I'm a scholar of African American history, and much of my work has drawn upon genealogical sources and family stories, um, drawing upon my grandmother's family stories in particular, 
Uh, and I know how powerful it can be to know um, where we come from. Um, so I was gonna talk first about why 10 million. Um, so the next slide should be that. Yep, well, it's not there. So with the 10 million um, number that we have um, uh, at the title of this project. So while we know there were 4 million enslaved who became free at the time of emancipation, um, candidly, there were approximately 10 million estimated who had been enslaved between the 16th century, so the 1500s, and 1865, the conclusion of the American Civil War. And those of us living today um, who are descended from those 10 million amount to estimated 43, 44 million Americans. Um, and so 1870 is an important year when we think about African-American genealogy, as many of you I'm sure know, um, because it's often referred to as the 1870 quote unquote brick wall. Uh, it marks the first federal census after emancipation in the South um, to officially record the names of people who were previously enslaved in large numbers. And while it's often referred to as a brick wall in the genealogical realm, when we're starting from present day descendants and working our way backwards, things become more difficult at that point. There are many other places we can go. There's many other places we have access to that can provide us with the names of our ancestors. And that is the painstaking work of this project. So um, among the goals of the 10 million names project, um, it's to establish a document-based research repository. Uh, in fact, the largest, most comprehensive database um, that we can of African-American names. And I should say this represents a diversity across the African diaspora in the US. So we're interested in people who may uh, have, have taken many different paths um, to um, this place. And perhaps they came first to the Caribbean before to um, what became the United States. And all of that is included um, in, in, in this 10 million. It also may be people who are of Afro-Native descent who have both African and Native American ancestors, for instance. Um, another goal is to amplify the voices of people who have been telling their family stories for many, many years, in fact, centuries. Um, so we know that uh, in this work, we are um, honored to be joining a tradition of, African, of the African-American kind of will to remember the ways in which, you know, my grandmother's stories and many, and many of ours here um, uh, were passed down one, one person to the next, one generation to the next over the last several centuries, um, even during enslavement, in some cases, um, in spite of and because of um, the erasure of knowledge that, that accompanied um, the period of enslavement. And we're aiming to connect people and resources. So it's really a collaborative project, um, which will trace research down to present day descendants. So those 10 million uh, uh, people enslaved in the land that became the United States, as I said, have approximately 44 million descendants living here today. And those 44 million are more likely to encounter difficulty in tracing our ancestry. And this is for many reasons. Um, first, first of all, slavery separated families and it also obscured family history or separated us from, our, from knowledge of our past. So before roughly the mid 20th century, data about enslaved Africans and African-Americans was often deliberately obscured, altered, or simply unrecorded in the first place. It's this lasting legacy of slavery, the erasure of family history that's still with us today. The next slide. Our ancestors were not only separated, as I said, from family members, but to varying degrees from their family histories. In fact, in his 1892 autobiography, the abolitionist uh, Frederick Douglass wrote, the reader must not expect me to say much of my family. Genealogical trees did not flourish among slaves. However, there are many places we now have access to thanks to technology and, um, and also stories that were told behind closed doors in many families um, that allow us to, to walk down this path. Um, we know better than ever today that names and fragments of family histories did circulate and hold value and in fact survive. This knowledge became all the more powerful in many ways because it was denied or obscured. And we know that African and African-American naming traditions became a form of empowerment and prideful identity. Knowing the names, origins, and life stories of one's ancestors can be incredibly life-changing. Now, I know this because I had the privilege of growing up in the 1970s and early 80s with my grandmother's stories. She's pictured here in the bottom row in the middle. And these were stories about growing up, in her case, African-American and Creek Indian 
in turn of, in the American West, in turn of the century Oklahoma. They were stories about slavery, but also stories about freedom and resistance. And, um, you know, when I uh, was growing up, we'd often at school memorize occasional facts about slavery or the Trail of Tears, but it was really through my grandmother and her stories that I learned the, the bigger picture, the much more complex and, and interesting um, truth. And those kind of family stories stayed with me, highlighting how incomplete many conventional narratives about American history were. Long before I cared about history, my grandmother's stories made me whole, pointing to things that I sensed, but that I often didn't have words for. Um, I also wanted to share this image of, um, uh, of a sack, which we often refer to as Ashley's sack. It's featured um, prominently in the Smithsonian for African American History in DC. Um, there's an entire book about it written by um, the wonderful historian, um, Taya Miles, who will be speaking um, um, this fall, in fact, uh, with American ancestors. And I'll just read this. This is a sac, um, an object that was passed down one generation to the next. Um, and, uh, and it was embroidered by Ruth Middleton. My great grandmother Rose, mother of Ashley, gave her this sack when she was sold at age nine in South Carolina. It held a tattered dress, three handfuls of pecans, a braid of Rose's hair. Told her it'd be filled with my love always. She never saw her again. Ashley is my grandmother, Ruth Middleton. And you can't quite see the bottom of that image there, but it gives you the year um, in the early 20th century. And so, um, this is just a kind of a physical manifestation of the ways in which stories and family knowledge did survive. And, um, you know, an object like this, a letter, a photograph that you might have in your attic somewhere can really lead us in so many directions. There's so many resources that we could draw upon in connection with an object like this to tell a larger story. And that, in fact, is done in the beautiful book by uh, Taya Miles um, that's called Ashley Sack. So in recent years, psychologists have begun to examine what human beings have long understood, the importance of what they call a strong intergenerational self, children knowing that they belong to something bigger than themselves. One study revealed that in the face of conflict and uncertainty, the more children know about their family's history, the stronger their sense of control over their lives, and the higher their self-esteem. And these findings have particular implications, I'd argue, um, that are incredibly urgent and hopeful uh, for African-American experience. And so when we think about this project, this 10 million names project, we are, um, we are also, we're not only thinking about our ancestors, but we're thinking about our, our descendants, our children, our grandchildren today, and, um, and how it changes um, the present, our presence and our um, sense of who we are um, in this day. So with that, I'll turn it over uh, to, to Lindsay. Hi, everyone. I'm here to talk about how we are going to go about defining and uh, naming the 10 million names, uh, the 10 million people who make up 10 million names. And we came up with a way to manage how large this project really is. Uh, and that is by creating five different flagship projects, little, um, well, large umbrellas that allow us to focus on certain record sets so that we can make progress. Uh, you know, this is going to be a very large project. It's going to take us many years to get to uh, the 10 million number. And we uh, feel that splitting it up into some flagship projects will help us with that. So the first, which is probably the largest, uh, we called Making America, which is the records of enslaved laborers within and beyond the plantation. Millions of enslaved people lived on plantations, in private homes, in universities before emancipation. And enslavers often created financial and personal records to track, count, inventory families and individuals laboring on their land. And while these records were initially created for the benefit of the enslaver, uh, genealogists can use these records to reconstruct family groups and rediscover names uh, of enslaved people. These records can be antebellum censuses, so looking at the 1850-1860 slave schedules, or maybe the ones that were done on a more uh, 
local basis, like the 1867 Maryland slave statistic schedule. We have plantation records that are created on plantation. So presidential properties, for example, like Mount Vernon, Monticello, uh, Montpelier. We also see private estate records that are kept that way. And we're also including what we call Bible records or really any religious texts that are recording names of individuals and maybe giving a birth date to them. Uh, that all falls within uh, Making America, as well as probate and land records. Like I said, this is not a small flagship project. Uh, probate and land will, will dominate many of the record sets that we're looking at for this particular flagship project. The second is looking at soldiers, veterans, and refugees on the battlefield. Prior to emancipation, Black soldiers served both voluntary and involuntarily in conflicts that are in what is now the United States, Canada, and the Caribbean. Um, enslaved and free men took part in the colonial wars, the Revolutionary War, the War of 1812, the Civil War. And later we see uh, Black soldiers, most of whom descended from enslaved people, participating in the Spanish-American War and the Philippine Insurrection. Record sets that we find for this group of, of people might include what we call military records. That's uh, muster rolls, payrolls, draft cards, uh, enlistment records, and then veteran records. Many of us will look at a pension. Pensions can be chock full of genealogical data, so uh, as well as some records that were created by uh, the Veterans Affairs Department. So like headstone applications, for example, we might find uh, names in those types of records. We also uh, allotted some of the records from Freedmen's Bureau in this particular flagship. Fleet Freedmen's, we actually broke up into two different sections, and I'll talk about one of them later on. Uh, Freedmen's is a very large record set, but we, we liked putting that into this group because that is going to help us with defining some of the refugees, uh, especially that come out of uh, the Civil War. Our third flagship is called Journeys to Liberation records of mariners, migrants, and freedom seekers. All throughout slavery, in pre- and post-colonial America, individuals and families of African descent pursued paths of freedom. Most family, famously, they used the Underground Railroad to escape, but there's other uh, enslaved people that turned to legal channels through freedom suits, they paid for self-manumission, they experienced emancipation through African immigration. There's invaluable collections of historical records that can provide us the opportunity to read accounts, sometimes firsthand accounts of formerly enslaved individuals and gain insight into their extraordinary paths to emancipation. Record sets that would be included in this flagship project uh, include records of the um, abolitionist groups such as American Colonization Society, court records, that's going to dominate the majority of what we're seeing here, uh, both on the federal, state and local level, that's looking at um, manumissions and such, uh, as well as firsthand accounts from the Underground Railroad. And then one record set that we find that's incredibly beneficial are um, runaway advertisements in, in newspapers that can help us to define um, names and some details about that person as well. The fourth flagship is community building. It's looking at records of uh, Black institutions. While historically Black institutions, organizations, and churches have played a pivotal role in the lives of men, women, and children of African descent after emancipation, some of these organizations were central to enslaved people in pre- and post-colonial America. These records were mostly created by people served by these institutions for the benefit of fellow constituents. Researchers can use these records to learn more about the first generation of free people as well as the ancestors and, and descendants. So in this particular record set, we're talking about records from schools for freed people and the records of Freedmen's Bureau. As I mentioned, we were going to divide that into to two different, under two flagship projects. Uh, church records, which we are, we, we know will be uh, abundant. Uh, and also historically black colleges and universities like Howard, Spelman, Morehouse, et cetera. And uh, 
members of fraternities and sororities, the, the, what's sometimes referred to as the divine nine. So record sets from all of those locations will help us uh, with, with the community building flagship project. And then finally, remembering slavery. This is testimonials after emancipation. This is hands down the most powerful and poignant and detailed records of formerly enslaved people. It's first, hand, it's first person accounts uh, collected in pre and post colonial emancipation errors. Oral tradition of persons of African descent and enslaved persons helped Black family history and culture survive. Like the records of historically Black institutions, these testimonials can help genealogists to learn more about the first generation of freed people as well as their ancestors and descendants. This is looking at uh, collections that were created by narratives that were collected by Fisk University, uh, the Virginia Writers Projects, and the Works Pro uh, the WPA. We are also looking for, uh, and I'll make a pitch for this later on, we're also looking for oral histories that are collected by individuals and families. They don't need to be part of this, these, like the WPA project. I'm interested in, in uh, family, family accounts that you may have uh, in your attic on a VHS tape, audio cassette. Uh, I'll take it however you got it. Um, I'd be very interested in hearing some um, oral histories as well. So that's currently the 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 five uh, flagship projects. I, I don't expect there to be more. Uh, we we feel like we have a comprehensive collection of projects for us. If we were to define, if we were to find additional record sets, that they should fit into one of these five categories. We are going to make all of this free and it is going to be publicly accessible. And we've created a beautiful website for people to interact with, to both learn about how to do your own family history, uh, how to search our the databases that we've created already, and then also how to share your own information that you may have collected. And I'm just gonna kind of walk you through the website. Uh, the website, we're just gonna walk you through the website. So this is it. It's beautiful. Uh, this is the home page. Um, and I'm just going to walk you through the, the first, the, the top bar here. Some of it we've already covered. So the about section really talks about the mission of 10 million names, as well as the advisory board, who's on the staff list, who's on the scholars council. Um, we've already kind of covered that already. The second tab here is projects. Projects are the flagship projects that I just chatted about. And then the third one here is uh, a map. And this is an interactive map that we created. And I'll show you just one of the pages of that. It's an interactive map that we created using census data. So something to keep in mind when you're looking at this, uh, at this interactive is that the data is all coming from the US federal census. That's the record set that we had that was the most comprehensive that could have us create something that would be beneficial for just a kind of understanding what free and enslaved populations looked like throughout uh, the history of the United States. So that's going to cover from 1790 to 1860. Again, this, the censuses are done on um, every, in every, every 10 years. So we see it in 1790, 1800, et cetera, um, all the way up to 1860, because the 1870 census, as Kendra was mentioning earlier, uh, is the first census, that, the first federal census that we get that will record um, newly emancipated uh, individuals. So the nice part about that map is that you can see like where uh, where free states were, where enslaved states still were um, were functioning, and then what the populations looked like in those particular areas. Uh, there's the a story section, which I would suggest looking at because it includes uh, information that we've gathered just kind of as we've been doing these projects, just interesting people that we've run to in and to along the way. That's a nice section to check out just for some uh, more in-depth information about uh, enslaved individuals and their stories and lives and children and families and all of that. Uh, we also have a research help section and I'll I'll walk you through a little bit of that as well. I know that doing African American genealogy can be difficult. So we created a landing page with some of the resources that we've created at American Ancestors. Um, there's some 
uh, there's links to the African American genealogy, which is a, um, a subject guide for you to look. And there's a bunch of links and information about when uh, record sets existed and, and when they were started. Um, Kenyatta Berry from uh, PBS, she wrote a wonderful little uh, essay about how she has found her ancestors. There's a whole bunch of listings on um, cultural sites, resources that are compiled by Family Search. Family Search is one of our partners in 10 Million Names. Uh, they they have wonderful education resources on their website. Their website's also free, and we have uh, charts and templates, so that can kind of help you with. Um, like, for example, there's a five generation chart on on that downloadable um, uh, site. So you can, you know, put your name in your parents names, your grandparents names, etc. It's just a nice way to just kind of see a roadmap of what your uh, family tree looks like based on the information that you might already have and then what you're able to add to it as you um, do research on your own. There's also the African American Genealogy Research Guide, which is this this third one here. Um, I would recommend looking at that as well. Uh, again, lots of links and and information about uh, you know strategies and uh, record sets, databases that you can search for your own family on. There's there's links and all that on there. Highly recommend it. Also free. Free is the theme of of the uh, the day. Okay, so uh, now we're going to search. We have created several databases. We have 33 thus far. So if you click on that search tab, it will bring you to our search page. You can search by a particular topic or you can search by name. So I've chosen the Black Loyalist Directory 1783 to 1788. Um, if you choose that particular database, then you're going to be searching just in that database. There's also a way for you to search all 33 at the same time too. just kind of play around with it. You can put in a first name in this first in this little field here, last name. You can include years if you'd like. And then there's this drop down that allows you to include record type. Uh, after 15 years of being a genealogist and searching on several websites, I will tell you that the less information you give them at the beginning, the better result you will get. <laughs> so don't be super specific with all, don't try to fill out every single field when you're doing a search. Uh, I, I actually recommend starting with a first name and a last name search just to kind of see what you get. And then you can narrow it down if you're getting too many results, so if you're looking for John Smith, then you might have to narrow it down after that. But I still would recommend just searching by first and last name to begin with. Once you do a search, you'll get results. So this is an example of what a result would look like. So I searched for Robert James. I found Robert James. Uh, it gives information that will be recorded on the actual record on this page first. So you see Robert James. The immigration date is given, the location of where um, he's disembarking. It's in Shelbourne in Nova Scotia. He's 26 years old. He's multiracial. Um, he's traveling on the ship Elizabeth. Now, if you want to see the actual record, you can click on this little camera. The camera will bring you to where we extracted that data from. So in this case, it's from a trans it's been transcribed from the original into a book and then we've created a database out of it. Um, so you can do that and you can go to view, you can print it, you can save it to your computer. Um, I always suggest looking at, at that little photo though because sometimes it's a handwritten record that might give you more information than what's on that initial search result page. Scroll down when you find something that's interesting on, so say that Robert James was your ancestor and you're very interested in it, definitely scroll down. Scrolling down will give you information about uh, the actual record set. So a citation and then a description of it as well. And the description might lead you to um, additional record sets that you didn't think to look for. Um, it will give you some historic context. It might give you ideas to search for um, different, you know, other ancestors on your family tree. I promise 
scrolling down and looking at the description is definitely um, worth it. We I, I spend a lot of time in the description section uh, on our databases, as well as databases from from other uh, organizations. Now we are adding to our databases all the time. So if you are 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 interested in hearing about what we're working on and what we've just finished, I would highly recommend signing up for database news. Um, I included the URL at the top there, dbnews.americanancestors.org. It's free. You can sign up. You'll get notified whenever a new database um, becomes available, and then you can go and search. A central part to what we're doing at 10 Million Names is involving the community. So this second panel here, Share Your Family History, is the way that you can share what you've done on your own family, whether you're a family historian or whether you're just casually interested in your family. Um, all of that is relevant to what we're trying to do here with 10 million names. Um, you might have a detail about your family history that no one else does, and we would very much like to know about it. So I'll just walk you through really quickly what that page looks like. Uh, so if you click on read more under where it says share your family history, it brings you to uh, this page, which uh, allows you to do several items. So there's several ways that you can interact with this. You can fill out a family history questionnaire. That's really for people who might not have like compiled, you know, mounds of data, but you have information about certain family members. And you want to give me their first name, last name, et cetera. Um, I'll show you a little bit. I'll show you what the form looks like. It gives you the opportunity to select whether the information is for someone who was enslaved or if your ancestors may have enslaved a family that is also important data for us as well so you can click one of those if you'd like us to know that information so information about enslaved individuals information about enslavers you're not sure or neither you put your surname in your mother's name your mother's date of birth um, if it's relevant, your mother's day of death, your father's name, etc. So we have several generations that are on this particular form that you can include just based off of the information that you just know off the top of your head. Incredibly beneficial for, for what we're trying to do here. And at the bottom, you just hit submit. There's a place for you to upload your uh, family tree. So most online companies, or mo actually most digital trees in general, they allow you to download what's called a GEDCOM. That basically makes the file readable across all softwares. So we have our own proprietary software called American Ancest Trees. And we can take the data that you have um, saved on your GEDCOM and then upload it to the American Ancestries area. So you can download. So if you go to that form, there's a place for you to attach the file and you just hit submit and it comes to us. You can upload family notes or a genealogy. So if you have a bunch of papers laying around and you'd like us to look at them, please, you know, just scan them, upload them, give us some information about what family group we're looking at, their surname, location, et cetera. And uh, that will come to our researchers. As I mentioned before, there's the oral history. This is just to show you kind of how quick this form can be. It's quick and easy. Uh, it will only take a moment, but it will be very beneficial to humanity. Uh, you can, again, click one of the four options there. You can give the family history a title. You can give a description of who was interviewed, and then you can upload what you have as a audio file. If you do not have an audio file and you have an uh, older uh, person in your family who you would like to interview, we also have some information on how you can conduct your own uh, little interview and then upload it as well. So just go to that page and it will give you some information about that. We're also looking for um, Bible records, which you can 
uh, upload directly to that form as well. So uh, definitely check it out, especially if you have family history documents and items kicking around your house. We would be very interested in um, seeing a copy of that. You don't necessarily have to donate it to American Ancestors, although we will take, <laughs> if you are interested in donating your collection, we, we would be very interested in chatting with you as well. Okay, so some of the key takeaways. Uh, we are we are hopeful that we will ultimately produce the largest, most comprehensive genealogical database of enslaved people of African descent in America. Um, we're looking at original genealogical research down to the present day. So we're trying to identify uh, the names of enslaved people and then bring that down to the present so that we can all um, do ultimately do a search and connect ourselves um, to enslaved individuals. This is being overseen by expert genealogists and historians in partnership with Black-led genealogical societies and individual families. We are leveraging the latest technology and resources so the data from smaller archives and libraries becomes available. And as I was pitching earlier, we are looking for data and documents about enslaved people. Uh, we're looking for family stories and family trees. If you have something that's in your own home that you feel would be beneficial to the projects, we are very interested in hearing about it. We're also very interested in partnering with other genealogical, historical, and community-based uh, organizations. So if you are involved with a another historical society or a, a community project where you're looking at data like what we've described today, we're very interested in chatting with you and the organization to see how we might be able to work together. Um, and of course, we're looking for investors to support the project as well. Well, thank you, Lindsay, and, and thank you, Kendra. Uh, we have a number of questions uh, that have been submitted by our audience, and uh, we'll, we'll dive right in. Um, I'll uh, send this over to uh, both Lindsay and uh, Kendra. Uh, we have a, an audience member who said, I'm just getting started in my family history and I'm interested in getting started. Do you have any recommendations for record sets I should begin with if I'm going to be my family's historian? Lindsay, do you want to take it? I, sure. So um, I am a huge fan. I don't know if you can be a fan, but I'm a huge fan of the United States federal census. I think that's um, the most comprehensive document or record set that was ever created that includes as many people as it as it can include. Um, so it 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 does not include the names of enslaved people and won't it won't include that as Kendra was mentioning until 1870. Um, but free people of color are included on it. And then from 1870 onward, uh, everyone that's living in the United States is in included on the, the census. It, you don't even necessarily need to be a citizen to be included on um, the federal census. So I always recommend looking there first and a, a caveat to all of that will be make sure that you find every census record that your family should be on. So if you look, if you find them in 1870, 1880, 1900, but not in 1910, but you find them in 1920, they should be on that 1910 census. So make sure that you try to find that. It's very rare that someone is skipped or, or not included. More likely, the enumerator just really messed up how their name was spelled or you know their handwriting was terrible or they misunderstood what the person said that is much more common than completely skipping over um like a, a neighborhood of, of, of a household whatnot um so definitely look at all of the censuses that you can get a hold of and look at all of the information that's included on the census so don't just look at the name and all of the people that are living in the household, look at all the columns that are included. They ask some pretty detailed information, um, especially those 20th century uh, censuses. You know, you find out if someone had a radio in the house, you know where their parents were born, um, if how many 
some census ask uh, how many children were born to you and how many children are still living. So you, there's an incredible amount of data that you can actually extract from the census. So this is my big pitch, talking much too long about it. Please look at the census. <laughs> Uh, another uh, participant asks, um, I realize that this project is largely focused on people of African descent in America. My ancestry is in the Caribbean. Do you have any suggestions for how I may start my family history? Uh, perhaps I'll uh, point that to uh, Dr. Greenwich. Yeah, so I, like you, my grandfather's family, my father's family is from Barbados. And so researching my own history falls in, would fall into this category. I would say that this is focused on people who were enslaved in the land that became the United States. Within that, however, as historians, we look at diaspora and the fact that many people who are descended, say in 2023, from people whose parents or grandparents migrated from Jamaica, those people still lived in communities and around people or intermarried, family members intermarried with people who were descendants of original of enslaved people on this on the area that became America. So that is to say that you can get a lot of your family history and the 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 um, dynamics of your family's past if they were someone of African descent and they came to the United States by searching this database because you're searching and being able to reconstruct many of the communities that people of African descent from outside of the United States came. Um, to get onto what everybody's been saying, and I I. I say this with um, sort of how exciting this is, is that it is going to become the most comprehensive database of, of formerly enslaved people on what becomes the United States, right? And so that means that you're going to have connections um, over time that you're going to see between um, ancestors of yours who are, say, from the Caribbean, but they lived in a neighborhood, say, in Brooklyn or in Cambridge, Massachusetts or in Oakland, in which they were surrounded by people who were uh, descendants of formerly enslaved people on what becomes the United States. So um, within the scope of all of the records we're looking at and recovering the names, it becomes a way to look at um, the, the interactions between people of African descent in what becomes the United States and people of African descent across the diaspora. Thanks, Dr. Rich. Um, there are a number of questions um, around um, commonly held beliefs or even myths around uh, researching uh, one's ancestry. Uh, in particular, um, is it true that most freed people always adopted the surnames of their former enslavers? Uh, perhaps I'll pose that to uh, Dr. Field. Sure. Um, uh, no, I, I wouldn't say, I would say that it is a, um, a, a complex story, right? There are some people um, who, um, part of what I call freedom's first generation who were born enslaved, children at the time of emancipation, after the Civil War, um, claim their own surname. Um, that might be Freeman, it, right, it might be the name of an of a ancestor that they um, were separated from. Um, it might be a first name in their ancestry that becomes a last name, or in some cases, it might be the name of the kind of plantation, which may well be a surname. Um, that was their home place uh, in, in many cases for a number of years. Um, so there's no real one uh, direction in this sense, but um, we we try to be as historians and genealogists um, open to all and all these possibilities and more. Um, so I keep an open mind when we think about name changes from the transition from slavery to freedom. Uh, another participant asks, um, I'm familiar with enslaved.org and freedom on the move. How does 10 million names differ from these existing projects? Uh, Lindsay. Um, I, th I think it's important for all of us to, be before we start talking about how we're different, um, I think it's important for all of us to uh, understand that like we're all in this together right so so we're going to need places like enslaved.org and other smaller historical societies to share information with us so that we can create this database that we're trying to create of the most comprehensive um database that is uh recording enslaved people 
Uh, that being said, we are interested, we are a genealogical organization. So we are very interested in the genealogy. Um, in addition to the names of the individuals, we're interested in the genealogy of uh, those people and their descendants. Um, and that's something that's a little bit different than uh, what we're what we're seeing with, with folks from those other organizations. Um, you know, we're people and the stories are are what we're we're centering this entire project around. Um, so that's the difference, I think. Uh, another question for you, Lindsay, uh, about partners and collaborators. Uh, a participant asks, uh, are you working with Family Search in the 10 Million Names Project? Why, yes, we are. Um, Family Search has been, they've been incredibly instrumental in many projects that we've taken on over the years. Um, they are very dedicated to 10 million names and helping us in any way that we possibly can. I meet with them actually weekly, and we talk about uh, record sets that they have that they might be able to make more available. Um, say, for example, um, <laughs> if you've been on Family Search before, sometimes they have a collection that that we sometimes describe as browsable. So it's a collection that they put up that is just images and it's not searchable. You can't look for Lindsay Fulton. You have to page through each reel of microfilm to find what you're trying to find. Um, we will have a conversation about record sets that are really important to this project and, and we'll make recommendations that that record set might be one that should be indexed in the future so that you can search for Lindsay Fulton and find a result. Um, so long answer for, yeah, yes, we are we are working closely with Family Search uh, on this project. Uh, Dr. Field, question uh, I think uh, to aim towards you. Uh, we understand from reading um, articles we've seen about the 10 Million Names Project in recent weeks, uh, that oral history and family tradition will play a role in this project. Um, can you speak to uh, what that will mean for the 10 Million Names Project over time? Sure. Um, so, um, you know, we, 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 we come to all sources as historians and genealogists with an open mind. That includes written sources and oral sources. As we all know, uh, many of the stories that we're told by our grandmothers or by others um, have many grains of truth in them. Some are outright um, parts of the past that we'd never know were it not for those um, ancestors sharing with them. Um, uh, we interrogate written records. We know that census takers had particular perspectives and didn't always um, uh, record things the way that we wish they would about our ancestors. We also interrogate our, 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 our oral stories, right? We know, I know that my grandmother told certain stories one way and her sister told it another way. Um, so all of this um, kind of malleability comes with the territory of doing history and genealogy uh, for, all, for all communities, inclu including um, the communities of enslaved people and their descendants. Um, so we are um, encouraging people to upload oral histories. Um, that could be a, a recording. It might also be a transcript. I know that like when I go, grew up going to family reunions in Oklahoma, um, and other parts of the country, we would always come home with a reunion booklet. And this summer, I was at I was at one in Pennsylvania, and came home with a with the booklet that had lots of valuable information in it. Sometimes transcripts of, of family stories or interviews. Um, so I encourage you to go to the website, and, and there's a place where you can upload that information. Thank you. Uh, perhaps for uh, Dr. Greenwich. A participant asks, what is the difference between record sources for New England and the Deep South? It's a good question. So I think um, New England, you know, slavery legally ends earlier than it did in terms of the federal emancipation in 1865. But that doesn't mean that there were not enslaved people, both Native American and people who were of African descent intermarried with those people. The, the, the records look slightly different in that Massachusetts towns and New England towns began keeping town histories um, earlier than other parts of the country. So, you know, as early as 17, you know, 95. 
five towns are creating their own sort of um, records of the history that are pretty detailed. Um, but um, I think the beauty of this project and the beauty of creating this database is to is to um, compile um, information and sources that allow us to see the similarities and the difference kind of in real time. So you're going to be able to see, for instance, um, Massachusetts or Rhode Island, for instance, keeping um, very intricate letters, le um, uh, records of um, Negroes or um, other people, they called them, say, in the 1740s and 1750s. And so as Liz and Zinzi was saying, it's part of getting those, those sources up there so that we are able to trace all regions of the country um, and all communities um, and account for the differences and the similarities. Uh, a participant uh, asks, and, and this is a, a question that's been asked in various forms uh, throughout the forum uh, this afternoon. Um, I am not of African descent, but I am the descendant of, of an enslaver. Is there a role for me to submit my family history and, and what my ancestors' records may say about one of the 10 million uh, for the project? Yes. We would like to see that. Um, when, when, as a as a genealogist, when you're working on the genealogy of someone who is enslaved, you are inevitably looking at the names of people who were enslaving people around that area. And and as the you know, there was a question earlier about um, a person taking the the surname of the person that enslaved them. And that is the case sometimes. So we might start there. So we're looking all the time at uh, and, and that's the 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 record set that we look at really first uh, to try to identify more information about the person who was enslaved. So yes, we we very much need information. Um, you know that's a that's a wonderful way for you to play a role in this project um, is to give us some information about, ancestors that you might have had that you had that might have enslaved people. Uh, someone asked a, a specific question. Um, you mentioned uh, during the presentation that federal censuses uh, do not uh, contain the names of enslaved people, but I understand that there may be some censuses that do. Uh, could you speak to that if you're aware of those instances? So I know that there are several, there are some counties in 1850 and 1860 that record people by name. So in the federal census, in the 1850 and 1860 slave schedules, uh, the enumerator for whatever reason, um, they misunderstood the instructions, they, whatever it may have been, uh, recorded people by name rather than underneath the, um, the name of the enslaver. So we're actually working on a project right now with Family Search to index all of the slave schedules in 1850 and 1860 where people are na are named and we're creating a database um, of those particular items. I would say it's maybe 5,000 people in total, um, a sizable number. Um, not of you know four million, but um, you know there were there were some people who were uh, re recorded by name. So those are that's one of the ones that I just know off the top of my head. Yeah, and I if I can speak to this as well, um, for as a historian who studies primarily New England and the diaspora, there's lots of ways that records were recorded of of named enslaved people, um, even if they weren't an official federal census. So towns, uh, somebody in a town, um, say in South Carolina, who kept a record of all of the people they saw, say in 1860 or 1850 in a certain area, some of those names would include enslaved people. Um, and that itself is a very valuable record. You know, you could have records of um, um, business records of, um, you know, stores and um, commodities that were sold and changed hands and the enslaved people's names being listed within those. So it's a matter of, you know, as historians becoming very, um, clog and genealogists becoming very cognizant of what type of sources you're using and from that being able to uh, find the names that might be missing or might not be in the census in the way that we, we originally thought that they would be. Thank you.
Um, we uh, amazingly have arrived at the end of the hour, and I would like to uh, thank my colleagues, uh, Lindsay Fulton, uh, Dr. Field, and Dr. Greenwich, uh, for joining us uh, for this introduction to the 10 Million Names Project. Uh, there will indeed be much more to come uh, over the weeks, months, and years ahead on this uh, project. We are um, incredibly uh, privileged at American Ancestors uh, to be a part of this effort and to uh, sponsor the 10 Million Names Project as a free resource and to collaborate with individuals, descendant communities, and institutions across the uh, family history and historical communities to recover the names and restore information to families of the estimated 10 million men, women, and children of African descent who were enslaved in America. Because names are powerful. Names give agency, names give humanity. And by restoring, recovering, and remembering the names of people who were enslaved, uh, we make strides uh, towards an effort to use family history as a source of education, as a source of connection, as a source of healing and repair, and a source of inspiration. Uh, the 10 Million Names Project work uh, is free. It is supported through philanthropy, and it is um, housed at American Ancestors as the oldest genealogical organization uh, in the country. But this is the direct result of a collaborative effort of numerous individuals and organizations who have been telling their stories uh, for centuries. And uh, we indeed uh, need help in this effort. Um, as you've heard at various points uh, through the presentation today, this collaborative effort uh, not only relies on institutions um, who have access to records, but also individuals and families and descendant communities uh, who are uh, willing to share their stories. And at 10millionnames.org, uh, there is the opportunity to upload uh, family trees, documents uh, from descendant communities, as well as individuals who descend from enslavers, uh, the idea here is that through a collaborative, amplified effort, we will meet the mission of the 10 Million Names Project to identify by name as many of the 10 million people enslaved in present day America as possible, and to begin the process of identifying uh, descendants of those individuals to bring the power of family history to even more people. And so uh, with this uh, effort, uh, we thank you for joining us and uh, would like to note um, a, a couple of upcoming uh, programs uh, that uh, certainly should be of interest on September 21st. Uh, Taya Miles will be with us presenting her new book, Wild Girls, uh, How the Outdoor Shaped the Women Who Challenged a Nation. And later this fall, uh, we will be hosting an online panel discussion with our Scholars Council for the 10 Million Names Project, uh, which includes Dr. Kendra Field as our chief historian, Dr. Kerry Greenwich, uh, as well as uh, Dr. Vince Brown and Dr. Brandon Terry and Dr. Uh, Tavolia Glimp. Uh, we are uh, pleased and privileged to be a part of this effort uh, in the 10 Million Names Project. And, and thank you all for joining us this afternoon and look forward to seeing you online uh, at a future program and hope that you will visit us at 10millionnames.org to learn more.